It is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Thanks to the AMA team for bringing together thought leaders and change makers who will be part of this very important discussion on Medicare payment reform. We've got a lot to cover today, but before I introduce our panel, I'd like to share why this topic is so important to the AMA, to physicians, and to the patients that we are privileged to serve. Physicians everywhere across every state and specialty continue to carry tremendous burdens, obstacles that interfere with our love of this profession, issues that have frustrated us and burned us out, burdens that are forced on that are so forcing so many physicians to turn their back on the practice of medicine. Over the last 20 years, a shrinking Medicare reimbursement rate for physicians have pushed many small independent practices to the brink of financial collapse and jeopardize the care of millions of American seniors. When you adjust for inflation, the payment rates to physicians who care for Medicare patients has dropped 26% since 2001. I don't know many businesses or any industry that can withstand a 26% drop in revenue and still survive, much less an industry like ours, which is so essential to the health and well-being of our nation. Meanwhile, I've seen high inflation, rising personnel costs, increased practice costs, and that as does exacerbate these payment cuts. Considering what my colleagues went through during the pandemic, this kind of financial blow was simply unconscionable. And it requires immediate attention from Congress before even more payment reductions kick in at the end of this year. As we know, this issue doesn't affect physicians alone. The current Medicare payment system has a negative impact on our patients. When doctors lack the resources they need to keep their practice open, they close their offices, or they reduce their hours, or they make do with inadequate technology and equipment, or fewer support staffs, or they limit the number of new Medicare patients they take or stop seeing Medicare patients altogether. We need Congress to pass a bipartisan bill that we introduced to the House of Representatives early this year, the Strengthen Medicare for Patients and Providers Act, H.R. 2474, which would do what the AMA has long advocated for, providing physicians with annual payment updates to account for the practice cost inflation as reflected in the Medicare Economic Index. This would simply put physicians on equal footing as inpatients and outpatient hospitals, skilled nursing facility, and others who receive payment through Medicare. We'll talk about this. We'll talk about that and more today with our panel of experts. I want to make sure that we have enough time to discuss these important issues and answer questions. So let's get started. I'm honored to introduce our panel of experts and people who are count on for information and knowledge. And let's have a good time, but let's educate you on how to best move forward. Dr. Ray Callis is an anesthesiologist and president-elect of the Texas Medical Society, who was focus on uniting physicians in one voice around TMA's priority, medical liability reform, battling insurance companies to improve coverage and access to patients, stopping scope of practice expansion, and limiting government interference in the practice of medicine. Welcome, Dr. Callis. Thanks, Dr. Underwood. It's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to talking with you and other colleagues about this topic we need to really focus in on. Katie Arico. Our senior vice president for health policy and advocacy for the American Association of Neurologic Surgeons, Congress of Neurological Surgeons, where she has represented her specialty before 
Congress and federal agencies since 1985. She is a staff liaison to a number of healthcare organizations and is noted experts on Medicare reimbursement, quality improvement, medical liability reform, and graduate medical education. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much, Dr. Underwood, for having me. It's a real honor to be part of this conversation. Todd Askew, the Senior Vice President of the American Medical Station's Advocacy, where he oversees the organization's legislative, government affairs, political, health policy, and private sector advocacy efforts. In his prior role as Director of Congressional Affairs, Todd manages, managed the AMA's congressional lobbyists, developing and implementing strategies to advance organized medicine priorities before Congress. Welcome, Todd. Thanks for hosting us, Dr. Underwood. So let's get down to business. I'd like to thank each of you for joining us today. I'd like to begin with the first question to you, Todd. I briefly touched on this in my opening remarks, but Todd, can you give us some more details about the current slate of Medicare payment, current state of Medicare payment, Ms. said that, the current state of Medicare payment? What are the issues with the current system and how do we, and how do we get there? Sure. Thanks again, Dr. Underwood. Um, as you probably heard last night or late yesterday afternoon, CMS uh, released the payment rule for uh, 2024, uh, which calls for a 3.34% across the board cut to the Medicare conversion factor uh, and a similar cut for anesthesia services. Uh, all of this is a result of the flawed Medicare payment uh, formula known as MIPS, uh, which came to us under the MACRA law that passed several years ago. Now, uh, the current system replaced the SGR, the sustainable growth rate. And at the end of the SGR, it was scheduled to produce cuts of, of 20 in the excess of 20%. Um, so MIPS was an improvement initially, but we are beginning to go back into this cycle where we were with the SGR, where each year medicine has to fight just to keep cuts from going into effect or to limit the size of cuts rather than making substantial improvements. Um, what the macro law uh, gave us was this kind of cobbled together set of legacy programs, uh, MIPS, uh, with the promise of new physician-driven alternative payment models uh, and a statutory payment freeze, uh, followed by very limited updates uh, in the out years. But what's really come about is the fact that the MIPS program has really failed to produce any significant increases in quality, while at the same time producing significant increases in administrative burden and practice costs. And the promises of physician-driven alternative payment models has for many physicians gone unfulfilled. Combine that with the statutory freeze, um, uh, combining the statutory freeze with payment uh, budget neutrality adjustments, uh, which are required elsewhere in statute, has resulted in across the board cuts uh, to physicians. Now, most other payment systems in Medicare also have budget neutrality cuts to offset uh, changes they make. But all of those other types of healthcare providers, hospitals or nursing homes, um, home health, they receive automatic inflationary-based updates every year uh, to keep up with the cost of inflation. So the burden of budget neutrality adjustments doesn't tend to have as much impact. Physicians are the only ones providing care under the Medicare program that don't have annual adjustments that help us keep pace with inflation. And that's our goal, as Dr. Underwood uh, mentioned in his opening. So where we are right now is we have a broken quality reporting system. We have no way to keep up inflation with inflation. And we are facing years of cuts that erode the value of Medicare payments uh, because of that high inflation. <clears throat> that's where we find ourselves. And that is what our challenge is uh, to work with Congress and the administration but to put ourselves on a better path. And that's a huge challenge. But it's a, but it, this is a mountain that we have to climb, and we have to climb it together. And on that note, Katie, your association, the neurologic surgeons, have done a lot of work with the AMA on this issue. How is organized medicine working in Washington, D.C., to develop and promote payment reform? 
Well, thank you for that question, Dr. Underwood. Uh, as as you noted, we've been working, we've been at this a long time, one way or another. And we we did think in 2015 when Congress passed MACRA that we, you know, we were on the right path, and 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 that was the reform, as as Todd mentioned, that was going to really drive medicine forward, improve value, uh, and help uh, physicians really be positioned to deliver high quality uh, care to their patients. Um, that's unfortunately not what's happened, uh, in part because uh, there have been challenges implementing the quality payment program and some of the macro reforms um, at the agency level. But also, as as Todd mentioned, there are some still basic fundamental challenges with the broken formula. We don't get that update. The budget neutrality, where you have to rob Peter to pay Paul to stay within a fixed budget anytime a CMS wants to make any changes to the Medicare physician fee schedule. So we have gotten together under the auspices of the AMA, who's convened multiple work groups, and we've been at this for a number of years. We have various work groups looking at ways to improve the alternative payment model program, ways to improve the, the merit-based incentive program or MIPS, ways to improve the uh, overarching structure of the fee schedule, including budget neutrality and the inflationary update. And bringing all that together, the AMA, uh, it, it, through that the, the convening of that AMA-led uh, work group, uh, Medicine came up with a basic set of principles that we released last year that were signed off by all the specialties and all the state medical associations. And those principles have three basic print, uh, pillars to them uh, in, in our efforts to seek reform. First is to get an annual inflationary update based on the Medicare Economic Index, which is a measure of physician practice costs, just like all those other providers in Medicare have. Second is to get some changes to that Medicare budget neutrality formula uh, so that we can exempt more services from budget neutrality or, or modernize it in a way that will help lead to predictable uh, reimbursement. So we don't have these wild swings or these unanticipated cuts from year to year that require us to go up to Capitol Hill and, and try and stop. And then the third pillar is getting at the quality uh, payment program and making some changes there. Um, and so uh, through that work, work that collaborative work, um, we we have uh, we've taken those principles and now we're converting those into legislative um, proposals. Uh, as as you alluded to, Dr. Underwood, at, the, at your opening uh, statement. Uh, we, we've been successful in getting one piece of legislation already introduced, H.R. 2474, which would provide physicians with an annual payment update based on the Medicare Economic Index. Just a few weeks ago, uh, the uh, uh, some members of the, the leaders of the uh, House uh, Doc Caucus, the Doctors Caucus, uh, issued a, um, a discussion draft bill that addresses elements of the budget neutrality piece. So we're working through that right now and uh, we're waiting for some technical assistance from CMS and some other input to make sure that that bill uh, is in good shape for introduction as well. And the work group is still working on some legislative proposals for uh, the MIPS and, and APM systems so that that'll be our third piece of legislation that we put forward. So taken together, we hope to move those principles into action through those legislative vehicles. And we're collaborating um, beyond the work group by uh, doing joint lobbying visits on Capitol Hill, sharing grassroots messages and, and the like. So I think this is uh, it's an exciting time for medicine in that we're united. We're really trying to do the best to represent uh, physicians and to make a difference and get these proposals across the finish line so we can actually once and for all, hopefully stabilize the fee schedule and um, and, and and get certainty into Medicare. So our, our doctors uh, don't have to quit private practice and go join hospital employment and, and things of that nature. Great, thank you. Now we know that this fight is not just in DC, right? That the battlegrounds are 50 states in the United States they're in every specialty organization that you've laid out for us, Katie, so eloquently. So, Dr. Callis, how has the Texas Medical Association been working to reform Medicare payments? 
As you know, uh, Dr. Underwood, Texas is not shy when it comes to advocacy. Uh, we're also very actively, we meet with our congressional leaders in Washington, D.C. and at home. I personally know all my U.S. senators are too, and many, many U.S. representatives and many senators throughout the United States and throughout uh, those uh, representatives. But but whenever I host these guys, uh, these women and men at my home, it's always important that I educate them about Medicare payment. And the reason why I educate them about Medicare payment is because we are the only business in the last 20 years that continue to get cut after cut after cut after cut. And we try to keep uh, our offices open. I don't know about any other business. If you decide to open a business to lose 28% every year and a plethora of your patients are Medicare, good luck to you, my friend. Uh, we at TMA, we I forcibly, actively educate our members in the sense that we forcibly give them as much knowledge as they want, let them drink through a fire hose. But we let them know about Medicare and we let them know that the fight is not just for private practice. The fight is for academic physician, uh, PE physicians, hospital-based physicians, you name the physician, everything's tied to Medicare. Also, too, our recent action that I sent out alert recently, we had more than 800 responses, the most we've ever had, almost up there with medical liability reform and also up there with scope of practice. We just had another tremendous year not allowing scope creep at all in the great state of Texas. We also take time to impress on our members the importance of advocacy. Uh, it's time for you to step into the game. I will tell you, uh, as a Gulf War veteran, if I didn't have my men and women that work belong beside me working together as a team, we wouldn't have been successful to make sure we came home safe and to make a difference in this world. Hey, look, I'm just going to tell you, our patients need our voice. Our patients need our advocating for them. And more importantly, if we don't do it, who will? So, uh, Dr. Underwood, I just want to let you know that I hope to God that everybody on this call listens. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's about we. And we have to work together to solve this issue that is totally hurting our elderly patients. And people deserve to have Medicare because they worked hard in this country to make it to what country it is today. Without question. Without question. So, look. I know people are asking this and they're beginning to wonder this. Okay, so what are our goals, you know, for Medicare payment reform in the short term and then looking down the road to the longer term for more permanent fixes? So I'm going to run this through all three of you, but we're going to start with, with Katie. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, in the short term, we're staring down another pay cut. And, you know, there's no way around that um, fact. And so I think, you know, just as... Um, you know, the saying, let's first do no harm. I think one of the things we are trying to impress upon, and we're going to be working in the in the coming weeks to impress upon Congress is that at you know, first step is to prevent this cut and and even think about giving us something that re, re, that reflects inflation in some in some way. So that that buys us some more time to continue to work on this legislation that I alluded to earlier. Um, and, and unfortunately, we keep getting in the same cycle every year. And as we're trying to move towards longer term reforms, every year we're faced with, you know, again, another cut. So we have to pivot and deal with that. And this year is unfortunately no different than the past few years have, have been. So we're going to be working hard uh, in the coming weeks to try and turn that that cut into, you know, a, a, hopefully a positive number, but at the very least, not a negative number. Um, in the long term, we're going to continue uh, working on those those bills that 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 I, I spoke of earlier. Um, you know, I think again, our our goal is to take those principles that medicine has come around and get legislation enacted and signed into law, so that uh, that, that that it will stabilize the system. And I think, you know, Dr. Callis, you're correct that it's not just about private practice; it's about academic; it's about all of our physician members. But you know we are we are facing challenges as as everyone um, uh, tuning in knows about you know physicians uh, shuttering their private practices either going into um, employment uh, employment with hospitals uh, or even uh, with uh, private equity and and uh, and other things because they cannot possibly keep their their doors open with a negative payment 
um, rates every single year. And that actually is problematic because it's driving up overall health care costs with the consolidation happening and the like. And so it's really in the best interest of the country to have a plurality of physician practices out there to keep costs down and to really broaden access as, as best we can. And the way we think we can do that is for is with these long-term solutions to the physician fee schedule. Dr. Callis, anything like to add to that? Yeah, I agree with Katie. Uh, as a private practice physician, uh, that has been, uh, matter of fact, our practice is the oldest medical practice in the state. I'm an anesthesiologist, uh, but I will tell you where, where, where the rubber's meeting the road right now is that if you want to do what got me involved in AMA and TMA was it was member driven. And most of the time, whenever we first started, we can all be honest here on this call, we were mostly independent practicing physicians or hanging the shingle on ourselves. Now we're at the crossroads. I still feel that this is to maintain the practice of medicine because everything as we move forward, physicians lead healthcare the best. And if we don't give them a platform to continue to provide for our elderly, which is payments, uh, sustainability, and uh, increased on cost of living and wages that we as practicing physicians are spending every year higher and higher and higher, where the revenue is now going this way, our cost of operating is going this way, it is not sustainable, Dr. Underwood. Uh, so I feel very strongly that members, please, let's get this done and let's work together. All right, like to add anything to that? No, I think Dr. Callis and Katie are exactly right. I think our long-term goal here has to be to make sure we have a Medicare physician payment system that allows doctors like Dr. Callis, like you, Dr. Underwood, to practice in the way that you feel is best for your patient. Maybe that is a large group. Maybe that's a small practice. Maybe that's a, a multi spe What is best for your patient should be the way you're practicing medicine. And you should not be forced financially to make compromises or to provide care in a way that you don't feel is best. And so that's number one for me. Selfishly, and for all of us are involved in healthcare advocacy beyond just this issue, I would like to spend some time talking about other ways we can improve the healthcare system in this country, instead of every year having to scramble to try and prevent more practices, doors being shuttered, more Medicare payment cuts, uh, more burden being heaped on physicians. We can, if we can get out of this cycle and build a stable payment uh, system, then we can get on to the business about making other improvements uh, to the health care that's provided in this country. Yes, you raise excellent points, all three of you. So the issue is short term, long term, we have to create a system that's sustainable, a system that improves health care outcomes and decreased costs. And, if, and in order to do that, Medicare payment reform is necessary so that we can stabilize the practice of medicine payment wise and we can focus on improving health outcomes, de improving quality and decreasing costs and improving the lives and the health care and the health of our citizens. Awesome. Man, I'm excited to have to be a part of this conversation. That's why I keep throwing in words in there so I can be real with you guys. It's not just that you're my friends and colleagues, but but this conversation is extremely important. So I'm going to keep moving, moving forward. So, Todd, I'm coming to you. All right. So the House of Delegates is convening soon at the interim meeting in National Harbor, Maryland, starting November 10th. And we will use this opportunity to highlight the needs for Medicare payment reform particularly since we'll be in close proximity to Congress. The interim meeting is one of the key policymaking meetings of the AMA that, that the AMA holds. In addition to the AMA annual meeting in June, where representatives, delegates from the state and national medical specialty societies gather to shape and create AMA policy. So what are some of the activities happening at the meeting surrounding Medicare reform? So first of all, I think it's important to remember that this meeting, the meeting of the House of Delegates is the, is the only time, happens twice a year, where the whole federation, the whole family of medicine comes together in one place and has the opportunity to speak with one voice 
uh, to our policymakers and to show the unity and the urgency uh, that we put behind this issue. Uh, and we need to keep that front and center is that we need to show uh, we need to show our leaders in government that the leaders of medicine are unified in the need to get this done. Now, during the meeting, there's going to be a lot of opportunities uh, for folks to engage in that activity. Uh, one of them is going to be with our enhanced grassroots grassroots booth. And I encourage all of you who are attending the meeting uh, to come by. Uh, there will be information and, and new opportunities, new exciting ways to engage uh, with your members of Congress and their staff uh, virtually. But if you're staying, I know some people are staying an extra day or an extra afternoon after the House concludes to go up to Capitol Hill. And we provide resources and information on to help you take that message directly to uh, your members of Congress while you're here uh, in the Washington area. Now, also importantly, on Sunday afternoon, uh, we're going to have a briefing. Dr. Underwood, you're, you're part of this, uh, Dr. Ehrenfeld, and, 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 and our grassroots experts as well. And we're going to showcase for you and talk to you about the latest um, developments on Capitol Hill. Uh, we can answer questions about the legislation. We're going to show you some of the resources uh, that the AMA has made available. Uh, so that'll be Sunday afternoon. There's no conflicts. It's an educational session. It'll be open to all the meeting, all those that are attending. But even if you're listening to the webinar today and you're not attending the meeting in per person, there are plenty of opportunities uh, to engage in this process. It's the physician voice, uh, as Dr. Callis said earlier, that's going to get this done. And so you can find those resources and tools to engage at fixmedicarenow.org. Uh, so far this year, uh, we've had over almost 230,000 direct contacts to Capitol Hill on this issue. It is making a difference. I know many of your many of the states and specialties also have resources available. I would just encourage you to contact, contact them every day. <laughs> every chance you get, make sure your voice is heard, encourage your colleagues to make their voice heard, uh, and we'll, we're gonna provide you the tools and the resources to do that. Yes, we're 1.1 million strong, right? All right, we're 1.2 million strong. So why don't we come together and let's make this happen, right? There is no reason for us to be dealing with this. So Todd, I'm gonna come back to you again. Okay, what have we? So what have you been hearing from members of Congress? Do they recognize that this? Do they recognize that this is an issue? That there are differing views on how to fix it or the challenges um, right now and more getting the attention of the lawmakers? Well. There's a lot going. I mean, let's say there's a lot going on right now. We're in very contentious times. There's a lot of acrimony. But I will tell you, a year ago, over a year ago, when we started in earnest pressing this issue uh, on Capitol Hill with specific policies, there was very little interest. Most of the policymakers didn't think it was very urgent. They didn't really put it high on the priority list. Uh, and you can understand it's a heavy lift. It's expensive. It's complicated. Most of the people uh, and their staffs on the Hill have never worked really on the payment formula that much, and it is very complicated. But I will tell you, and I bet Katie and Dr. Callis can echo this too, the more you talk to people now, they know there is a recognition. There is an acceptance, even by those who don't want to do it, there is an acceptance that sooner or later, and that is sooner rather than later, Congress is going to have to step up to the plate and take on this issue because it is clear uh, that it is that it is not that it is not sustainable. Even MedPAC, the Congressional Advisory Committee that advises Congress on Medicare, which has previously said all is well, access is good, people are still taking Medicare, even they have said, but we don't think this is sustainable, and we do need to start giving inflationary based updates to physicians. And so I, I think we have. And our collective work together changed the conversation, changed the sense of urgency. And, and I think that's, 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 that is the kind of momentum we need just to continue to build on uh, as a federation. So how can physicians get involved? Dr. Callis, we'll start with you and then uh, move to Katie and then Todd. Thanks, Dr. Underwell. Well, first thing physicians need to do is to make sure that they know their legislator. 
And I'm not talking about just know them uh, by name. I'm talking about know them and getting in contact with them and make sure that you put information of your information in front of them and let them know that not only are you a physician, but you're also an American that takes care of a lot of Americans and that I would give them your phone number, your email. I'd contact them any way I possibly could. Uh, you got to get involved. We can no longer sit in our offices and just hope things are going to get better because I'm telling you, they will not. Um, I will tell you, we have the power. We have the influence to make a difference, but we have to take action. Action is nothing more if you don't use the words behind it. Just like when we were uh, educating our kids, we wouldn't tell them you have to use your words. Let's use our words and let's talk to legislators, both the AMA and TMA and the medical resource centers that we have gives you everything a physician needs in order to make you successful, to be a strong voice for our profession and for the patients that we deserve to take care of. And for this, for this excuse me, physicians need to use every resource they possibly can to get involved, get involved, get involved. And also, guess what? Guess who your biggest involvement should be? Educate your patients. Every single patient deserves to make that phone call to a legislator because guess what? Not only do you touch the lives of one, you touch the lives of many. And guess what? If you tell your patient, hey, Miss Smith, I might not be able to take care of you anymore in local little small community of Texas or in Massachusetts or in California, doesn't matter because I can't afford to stay open. That shocks and awe patients because of that commitment that you've given them throughout their whole life. And now you're going to abandon them because the government's abandoning them. I think it's totally wrong. Let's use our allies and our assets. If we're going to win this war, let's use our patients as well. Educating our patients and getting them to talk for us is powerful than you will ever think. We use it all the time in the great state of Texas. And I highly recommend with Todd's leadership and, and Dr. Underwood and Katie, I think you going up to the Hill and being the physician discussing this is a lot louder than if Todd's doing it or if Katie's doing it, because guess what? We live and breathe and we take care of a lot of Americans as a group. And you know what? I'm going to tell you what I tell people in the state of Texas. I'm tired of you saying somebody else will take care of it. You need to take care of it. You need to be responsible for this because guess what? We all took the same oath and guess what? We all take care of the same patients. So I'm committing my state, I'm committing myself that we'll continue to do that. I want everybody else on this call to do the same thing. It's now time to put up or shut up and let's lead. Physicians need to lead. Put up or shut up, baby. Put up or shut up. Yes, sir. Katie, what do you think? Well, it's hard to, that's a tough act to follow, <laughs> uh, very evangelical, but, uh, you know, I, I agree. Look, the fact of the matter is physicians as a profession are really highly regarded at the top of the you know the 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 polls in terms of their uh, their opinion being valued by the public and by policymakers in Washington D.C. and in the state capitals. So uh, you you already got that going for you. Now you just have to do what Dr. Cal said. You have to act on that. You need to take advantage of that. You know, you you want those members of Congress to have your cell phone number and be calling you. You've got to build those relationships. I mean, the minimum physicians can do is when they get a grassroots alert from the AMA or one of their state or medical specialty societies, it it, it we make it so easy for you. All you generally have to do is click, you know, put your name in and click send. We've got draft letters that are already ready for you. So that's the minimum you can do. I mean, you need to meet with them. And coming to D.C. is fine every year at an annual fly-in or at something like the National Advocacy Conference. But you really need to you, you need to meet them at home where they live. All politics is indeed local. So you know, getting to know them back at the district and in your state and showing up more than just once a year. Uh, there are other ways you can participate in a town hall meeting so, uh, and and raise these issues in those in those forums. And that actually is helpful because it gets the other constituents who aren't physicians to be party to that conversation uh, involving your patients. Like you said, Dr. Callis, um, we you know, I don't know, we'll get into this a little bit, but, you know, there's a lot of writing an op ed 
um, you know, making yourself uh, present on social media. I mean, all of these things are steps that physicians and, and their patients hopefully can take to raise awareness. It, it is it, it was remarkable when we got the SGR passed, uh, reform passed, uh, repeal passed, that, you know, we were talking in acronyms, SGR, this, SGR, that. Nobody knew what we were talking about early on. But with sustained, ongoing, year after year, day after day, advocacy and, and the voice of physicians being heard on Capitol Hill and beyond that, I mean, I could watch a cable news show and I heard SGR mentioned, you know, someone in a grocery store met their member of Congress and he said, oh, I'm getting that SGR fix. I mean, we need to get the same level of awareness and and that will help us get across the finish line because uh, that's what happened the last time we had to go through this with the SGR repeal. And I know we can do it, but it's going to take all the physicians working together, driving the same messages home and engaging at every level that they can uh, with their physicians. Now, one final note, I realize this is a policy discussion to a certain extent, but I think it's also important for physicians to get more involved in the political process. And you need to be uh, attending fundraisers, contributing to your members of Congress, creating those opportunities to uh, engage in the conversation and demonstrate your activity as an advocate for your, your practice and your patients. And that is another essential component. So giving to AMPAC, giving to your state PAC, giving to your, your national PAC, giving to your the candidates that are, are running for office and, and lawmakers is another important piece of this puzzle. Todd. No, I think that's exactly right. All to your pay. I mean, that I have nothing to add to that. That's that's two very comprehensive answers. I agree. Well said, Katie. Why is it important for physicians across the specialties and states to be involved in these efforts? And you may have already answered this, but I'm gonna hit you with it again. Let you go a little in deep, a little depth there. How do physicians voice influence advocacy efforts in organized medicine? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think we've generally covered that question uh, to a certain extent, uh, Dr. Underwood. But I mean, I think that, you know, it goes without saying, you know, and I know people like to say this, if you're, you know, not at the table, you're on the menu. You know, there are a lot of different ways to express apathy, uh, the effects of apathy, the effects of not being there. But look, we are one industry that is up on Capitol Hill clamoring for relief, including, you know, finance, you know, money from a, a, a fixed pot uh, uh, that's available uh, for, for, for these kinds of initiatives. And so it is absolutely essential that Congress hear from physicians. Otherwise, you know, they don't hear much from us. They'll say, well, I guess they're not really hurting that much, or uh, uh, we'll just, we'll just reallocate those available funds, maybe to the hospital hospitals or to the managed care companies or, you know, pharma or some other other place. And so we need to be there. So we're heard and that and, and we're taken seriously. And so I think it's it's absolutely essential, again, for physicians to get involved with their state and, and, and national specialty societies, respond to grassroots alerts, um, you know, keep up on what's happening, participating and watching webinars like this so you're informed. Uh, and, and, and those that amount of effort will, you know, when multiplied by the 1.2 million or whatever you said, Dr. Underwood, the number is now, will speak volumes and it will be heard. Um, and I think that, you know, look, you know, participating in the AMA House of Delegates process and, and your own state and specialty policy making uh, 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 processes is a way to get involved more broadly. But we really need uh, a grassroots push uh, a, a, a from physicians across the country to really to really uh, get this across the finish line. Well, I'm going to I'm going to summarize this in the, the words of Dr. Callis. We got to put up a shut up. And it's time for us to put up, right? So, because they've been telling us to shut up. So let's come together. Let's make it happen. Let's get this going. So look, this has been great, but we got our participants over 500 who would like to answer questions of this extinct panel. So now is the time when you, our virtual audience, will have the chance to have your questions answered. 
our AMA team will help us in, with the response to your questions. So if you got questions uh, for our panel, if you haven't already, please add questions to the chat and we'll get started now. Now we already had some questions added to the chat during this conversation, which is good. That means that people are engaged, they're listening, they're excited. So here's a question, I'm gonna go with this one. I believe Medicare payment reform will require a coalition of efforts, including the AMA, State Medical Specialties, National Specialties Society, and County Medical Societies to engage non-AMA physicians and their patients. Is this being considered as part of the advocacy strategic plan? Whoever. No, let me let me let me start with that. Obviously, our advocacy and grassroots or efforts are open to all physicians. FixMedicare.org, FixMedicareNow.org. Uh, that is available to everybody who wants their voice to be heard in this conversation. In terms of working with the states and the specialties, yes, 100%. We do that every day. Katie Enrico's office is just literally 50 yards from where I am, and she is engaged in our work all the time, along with all the representatives of the states and specialties. We come together on quarterly calls. We also have letters and communications to the Hill because the strength that the AMA brings to this is the collective strength of all of medicine, not just AMA, but the College of Neurological Surgeons it is the Texas Medical Association. It is everybody's voices coming together. And when we send our communication, when we come up with our consensus statements, when we come up with legislation that we can all get back together, they know they're not just talking to the AMA. They're talking to a broad coalition of physician organizations who are all united with that same goal of producing and enacting a more sustainable uh, payment system. It is never going to be just one organization gets it done. It's going to be all of us working together. You know, if I can jump in just real quick on that too, just to amplify that. Um, you know, and I'll, there are a lot of issues that can divide us, and even within this issue, there are a few little side issues that that tend to divide us, and that's because of that budget neutrality problem. But aside from that, I think you know when we are working all on the same song sheet and we're we're pushing together, we really are able to accomplish things. It doesn't all mean under the auspices of the AMA or 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 another group, we can all be talking and using and leveraging our unique uh, position within our specialty or within our state to punch through. So for example, for the past three years, um, the surgeons got together and we formed something called the Surgical Care Coalition. Um, it wasn't, you know, to do something that it, it was in furtherance of the same messaging that everybody was 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 speaking uh, uh, to at the time about how we needed to reform Medicare, et cetera. But we we had our own unique, you know, sort of context for that conversation. So I think there are those opportunities for the specialty states, county medical associations as well. To, 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 to band together with what may be their unique perspective uh, on the same issue, but saying that driving the same message of reform home. And I think that's where our collaboration across the Federation has really been quite spectacular because we've been able to, to really, you know, zero in on those, 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 those uh, messages that resonate with all of our physicians and our physician organizations uh, in service of the, of the goal. Well said. You know, I'm listening to this and I'm saying, listen, there isn't a physician practice, right? Whether you're in private practice, large group independent practice, employee physician and academics, non-academic settings, venture capitalists, that is an impact by this. And I think Dr. Uh, Dr. Callis said this, Ray back, uh, Katie backed it up, and um, Todd added to this as well. So we're all impacted this, whether you're a member of the AMA or not, a member of your state specialty society or not. And if you're not, then you should be. Join it. Let's get it. Let's deal with this together because it impacts all of us, right? So having said that, as physicians workforce continue to be stressed on increased practice expenses, 
annual reduction in clean claims rate and reduced employee retention rates, how can independent or small practitioner groups survive without a predictable reimbursement? Um, I'd like to take that first and foremost in my hand, which you probably can't tell. Um, like I said before, Dr. Underwood, I'm a private practice physician uh, working many hours taking care of Southeast Texas. And, you know, Texas medicine is based on a lot of independent practices and small group practices. But, the, but I'm talking to, to America. I will tell you that the biggest two words that this whole problem that we're facing is practice viability. If we do not correct this, practice viability is threatened with the big noose around our neck. The reason why this is important, every morning when I wake up, I look at this piece of paper and everybody's probably wondering, what's this piece of paper? It's from a colleague of mine that has been taking care of Texas Medicare patients for 25 years. She closed her doors this past year due to the fact that she could not afford to keep her clinic open. When I'm telling you, I get emotional even reading this because it's like reading a letter from your grandmother who tells you how they wish they had more money to give to their grandkids so their grandkids could buy a cute outfit for a party or for an event for the holidays. But, you know, my problem is, is that who's talking for the Medicare patients if it's not us? So um, being independent, it comes with a lot of responsibility, but the one responsibility physicians shouldn't have to deal with is payment responsibility when we're dealt with a hand that is completely a losing hand. And, and I just challenge everyone to go back home and talk to your colleagues. I'll tell you right now, I agree with what Todd said, what Katie said, what Dr. Underwood said. I have many physicians in the state of Texas that aren't TMA members, Texas medicine member. I know a lot of my friends that aren't even AMA members, but the one thing we all are members of, we're a member of the physician community. And our physician community should be based on taking care of all patients, all patients. But if you can't do that to have practice viability and sustainability, we're hurting Americans. And the reason why we're hurting Americans is because the government didn't want to make it right to make you your, your, your burden less. Because I agree with what Todd said, and it's echoing to me right now. If we didn't have to worry about this stuff that we're dealing with related to payment, we can move on to bigger and better things and make America a better, safer place based on morbidity and mortality too, instead of us having to fight this every freaking day in order for us to maintain practice viability. So I'll be quiet, Dr. Underwood, but, but you know, I mean, it, it is what it is. Uh, I, like I said, I, I want to encourage all physicians to come together and let's be one voice and talk about this. It's very vital. Next question, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that comment, boom, like many other comments, uh, you know, hit a home run and hopefully it resonates uh, with, you know, with everyone out there. So on the chat again, so this is not a new problem. We haven't been successful in obtaining increases um, with our strategies to date. We have explored other avenues. Have we explored other avenues uh, to advocacy? In other words, what are we planning differently uh, with this advocacy attempt? Well, I, I don't agree entirely with the premise that, that we have not been successful. We were successful in enacting MACRA and MIPS. Uh, that was $140 billion invested in the Medicare physician payment system uh, after a lot of work by, by a lot of folks. It was implemented in a way that was a complete failure. It was implemented in a way that did not present the opportunities that were promised for physicians to to take advantage of new ways to deliver care and to benefit financially from healthier patients mean healthier bottom line. And so, so that was unfortunate. And we are where we are. I would say most physicians don't even realize that in 2021, Medicare had scheduled a 10% cut, 10% budget neutrality adjustment. And medicine came together and stopped that cut. And what we're seeing today is just the cuts we've seen in the last two years is Congress kind of taking back a little bit of the bonus money that they gave each time to put us back where we would have been, you know, three years ago. 
And that's a heavy lift. But that is what distracts us, having to fight this fight every year, this end of the year, stop this 3% cut, stop this 4% cut, instead of focusing on the big payment reform. You know, what it took to be successful last time was when they came us with a fix for a 20% Medicare cut from SGR, we said, no. We said, you know what will happen if you implement these cuts, but we're not going to validate this process anymore. And Congress was forced to come up with the with a solution. Um, and it may be that's what it takes this time. So the main thing is for us to maintain unity. We have a good plan. We have strong support. We have some champions on Capitol Hill. The strongest champions we have on Capitol Hill, and Dr. Callis will understand this, are those that have provided care to patients. Democrats and Republicans, the physicians on Capitol Hill get it. And when their colleagues on the Hill go and ask, is this really an issue? You know, they're there answering, absolutely it is. And we got the solution. And so I think we just need to maintain unity uh, and keep fighting. I know it doesn't feel like, <laughs> it doesn't feel really good when, hey, guess what? You only got a 2% cut last year instead of a 4% cut. That is not sustainable. And we understand that 100%. But we just need to keep unified, keep pressing on. We know where we need to be. We know what the goal line is. We know what the solution is. And so I think we're on the right track. Right. So along those lines, so will the AMA be doing a public information campaign on behalf of physicians to notify patients that unless the pay cuts are reversed, they can expect further decreases in the level of quality of services they will receive? I mean, I think Dr. Callis uh, alluded to to that as a, as the a one important thing to do is to talk to your patients about these challenges. Talk to your patients about what um, what uh, these uh, cuts and what this payment system is doing to the Medicare program and and your ability to continue to uh, participate in the Medicare program. Um, the resources are there for physicians to use. Uh, we are pushing those out. The number one thing we've pulled this. We're not just making this up. We've asked mm -hmm. seniors. Uh, through uh, extensive research, what's the most important thing? And it's not, well, my doctor needs to get paid more. It's not, it is stability in the program. And on your and their physicians are the ones that can tell them that this annual fight, this annual threat, this long-term challenge to the fiscal viability of physician practices is what puts the stability of the Medicare program uh, at risk. And Dr. Callis said, almost said the exact words we heard from patients when they were polled. They said, I worked for this my whole life. I worked for this access to care and I deserve to continue to have it. And so all physicians need to work to make sure the patients understand that that, that is what is at risk here. Uh, Dr. Underwood, I'd agree with Todd. I just want to put one thing out there that I encourage all the other states and, and especially societies to do. Uh, at our last uh, meeting uh, with the Board of Trustees, uh, we came out with push cards, not push cards for physicians, but push cards about fixing Medicare to the physicians' offices that we're distributing and letting them put in their offices. I think uh, we, we've been very successful with that related to scope of practice. And I think that we're going to be very successful getting our patients, calling our legislators and letting them know. It's a simple card. You want to make it very easy to read. Self-explanation, very simple, and we give them a phone number on the back. I mean, it's very simple, and I think that I would encourage us to look at some avenues like that where you hit home, and home is where the physician lives, where they're taking care of these Medicare patients. You know, if I could just um, add, because I know that you know, in terms of um, are we doing anything different or what, what, what are some of the things we're doing, just to amplify a little bit what Todd said, you know, your professional advocates like like Todd and I can go up and and even on the grassroots level you can you can you can contact your congressman um, and and have those relationships. But it, unless you have the sort of secret member of Congress handshake, you know you're not in the room and and you're not the one that really controls the power. And uh, and and so we are fortunate. We're beyond fortunate. And when you start looking at some of our signature pieces of legislation that, that 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 we're working on in medicine, there's one common theme, and that is the members of Congress who are now elected officials in Congress are our biggest champions on the inside. And so, you know, it's Dr. Bouchon, a former 
a cardiothoracic surgeon from Indiana, Dr. Ruiz, an emergency physician from California, Dr. Burgess, a former OB-GYN from uh, from Texas, and, and the list goes on. And they have been consistently our partners in these and other issues like prior off. I know that's not the topic of today's uh, uh, conversation, but uh, it's really important. Uh, uh, and, and that's part of our strategy is to really engage with those physician members of Congress who can tell those stories and, and convey the messages in, behind closed doors where we do not have access. And so that is something that we have really been, I think, leaning into as a community to to leverage um, those those um, those relationships and to help empower those individuals um, to help uh, fix these problems. These are some very, very important points. And we're now coming down to what may be the last question. Also, Medicare Advantage programs are not paying bills and are requiring prior I guess it must be authorization and still not paying in Southern California. And so hospitals and practices are no longer going to take these programs, which leaves patients at risk. And how can how can we address this? Is it okay if I jump in? Please. Okay. So um, you know, now uh you know, for the for the first time this year, Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, took care of or had more Medicare enrollees than traditional Medicare. So Medicare Advantage is here. It's not likely to go away. I think the good news is the spotlight is on Medicare Advantage right now. Um, Congress, uh, in fact, MedPAC uh, today on its agenda had a couple hours of looking at Medicare Advantage in, ter in terms of you know, how they get paid. Uh, because Medicare Advantage got a pretty steep increase this year, and they're getting another one next year. Um, what they're doing to delay and deny care through prior authorization, which is uh, really uh, harming patients and 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 jeopardizing good patient outcomes. Uh, so the good news is it's not going uh, unlost on Congress. Uh, several leaders uh, in Congress, um, Chairman Wyden and the Senate Finance Committee and others, as well as our physician leaders who are are leading the charge on prior auth reform are uh, are are aware that these are are problems and so i think uh, you know we have to walk and chew gum at the same time and so we are monitoring all of this we're we're working with congress uh to try and the regulators to try and hold medicare advantage plans accountable and so I think uh, another bipartisan um, uh, issue is to really look to make sure that MA is serving the needs of all these seniors. And so, um, you know, it's it, to be continued, but it is something that, again, that the physician community writ large, including the AMA, state and specialty societies are collaborating on. Just to add what Katie said, I think what we're seeing over the last year or two, and in fact, this year we were actually seeing some hospitals and some large physician groups walking away from MA right, plans right. because of some of these problems. Anybody who had it in the back of their mind that MA, because everybody was just going to join an MA plan, that we could just let fee for service wither away and not have to worry about what we're talking about today, should take this as notice that that this it is not the... It, it's an important part of Medicare program. As Katie said, half of seniors are enrolled. It is not going to replace the fee-for-service system and the stability that is needed for small physician practices who choose not to, you know, who, who uh, choose to practice that way. Uh, it is it is important, but it is not a replacement for having to deal with the problems that we're talking about today. And it sounds like it may be creating other problems or at risk of creating other problems. But step by step, we stand together. And we'll address these issues. Look, this has been great. We're now coming to a close. So I'm going to wrap this up. But I'd like to thank, thank you to our audience for your questions. Thank you to our panel for sharing solutions. We have heard a lot today from our experts. And through our questions, we have learned a great deal more about our collective efforts to reform our unsustainable Medicare payment system. How much we've accomplished, 
and what is ahead. Medicare payment reform has been central to our federal advocacy this year and will be a major focus at the upcoming AMA interim meeting the House of Delegates in Washington, D.C. area later this month, November 10th. We hope some of you will be there. The solutions we seek won't be found in any one session, but together, we'll keep working together to find them. The AMA will continue its advocacy, and we hope you will too. We need you to stand with us, to stand strong with us. Remember, we are 1.2 million physicians strong, and together, we can not only solve this problem, but we can solve all the problems that face our healthcare system. Thank you very much for joining us today and thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing you in DC. Let's make this happen together. Peace.